Hi, everybody. Welcome to our latest installment of our series of interviews for Filipino American History Month. I am head over heels about the fact that I get to interview one of my lady crushes, Angela Garbus. <laughs> um, so I bizarrely sent Angela a DM on Instagram two years ago after I heard her interview with Terry Gross on Fresh Air about her book, Like a Mother, and was just really bowled over when I discovered that she was Panay like me. So I'm super thrilled to be here and have a chat with her. Um, Angela is a writer based in Seattle. Um, and let's just get right into it. Okay. Uh, I should just say, Genevieve, that the crush is completely mutual. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, am, uh, I have gotten dressed up for my first official friend date with you. We've been in communication for two years, and we've never sat down to do this, and I'm so happy to have this opportunity. So, um, what would you like our, our audience to know about you, just as sort of like an overview in terms of where you grew up, where you live, and what you do? Sure. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm a writer. Uh, I wrote a book uh, two years ago called Like a Mother, which is a, a feminist uh, view of the science and culture of pregnancy, because oddly there isn't one that's out there. Really. <laughs> um, but, uh, and right now I'm, work I'm working on another book, which was due in July. <laughs> But because I didn't have childcare for um, four months, that didn't right. happen. Oh, uh, and that book is a book of essays that, like my first book, is a combination of personal narrative and research. Um, and it's all about using the human body as a lens to talk about different aspects mm -hmm. of culture. Um, so I, I'm a nonfiction writer, and that's the work that I do I'm here in Seattle. Uh, but actually, my career as a writer started uh, as a food writer. Um, so I worked for years reviewing restaurants and trying to do free writing that wasn't reviewing restaurants, but it was kind of hard to <laughs> make a space in that way. Um, I grew up in a really small town in Pennsylvania. It was really rural and very white. Um, my parents are immigrants from the Philippines. My mom is from Mandaluyong, Manila, Amateur Manila, and my dad grew up in San Fernando, Pampanga home of the best food, uh, <laughs> period, in the world. Um, and yeah, that's, um, it, it kind of was unexpected that my, my, I had actually given up writing for a while because uh, this was like the, a recession that happened back in like 2009, you know, uh, it was really hard to make a living as a freelance writer. And I thought that maybe, maybe it wasn't worth it. And just because uh, just because I loved writing and I was good at it, I for a long time didn't necessarily think that mean, would mean that I would get to do it. Um, and so I had actually uh, applied to graduate school and was going to go get a degree in public health and nutrition. Mm. And I wanted to work with immigrant communities to help them have culturally appropriate diets that were healthier. Um, but then uh, this is a long answer, sorry. Um, I can do it, keep going. <laughs> yeah, so I, had, I was actually like on this other path where I wasn't, I had given up writing. And then I got pregnant and I have two daughters, Noli, who's six, and Lagaya, who's two. Uh -huh. <laughs> when I was pregnant with Noli, um, my due date was the day that I was gonna start graduate school. So I deferred. Um, and then after she was born, I got a call from the Alt Weekly here in Seattle that was like, we have a staff writer job. Um, we want to hire a staff food writer. Like, do you want to come? And I was like, no brainer. Like, this is my dream. Mm. Um, and so that was 2014. And so I've been a writer since then. And then um, the opportunity to write my book came from an article that I wrote there at the paper. So mm. that's just, I just say yes to things and follow opportunities when they come available. And I don't take it for granted that I get to do this. And it's like literally a dream come true to be a writer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you always love word <clears throat> writing ever since you were young? Yeah, I think, um, yes, for sure. Again, I never, um, you know, I, my parents, <laughs> God, when I, they're so adaptable, they're so wonderful, they're such wonderful people. You know, I went to college and was like, you know, I, I worked at the school paper when I was in high school. Uh -huh. I did um, speech and debate. I did uh, uh, 
oral interpretation, which is that I used to read poems and short stories. Yeah. So, I mean, I was clearly like in love with words and, um, you know, certain element of performance or communication. And my poor parents, you know, like I go to college and I'm like, I'm going to study English. And they were like, what is that? <laughs> like, they were like, you already speak English, right? Like, so it was a, like, they're very supportive, but the immigrant mentality is like, what, what are you going to do with that? Like, how is that a job? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, like I just never, I, I, you know, I pursued all of these jobs. Really, they're just a bunch of dying industries. Like the first thing I did <laughs> out of college, I interned for a poetry press. Um, then I worked in independent bookstores, <laughs> you know, and then I went back and worked for the, 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 the nonprofit poetry press for a while, which is going strong, actually. It's called mm -hmm. Copper Canyon. And they're wonderful. Um, and then I worked in all weeklies uh, and, and publishing. So it's really, I've always been adjacent to this stuff even before I was writing on my own, um, writing for myself as a career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So since you brought up your parents, I was, I was mm -hmm. actually, I just thought of this this morning. It, um, I'm always like interested in parents, especially immigrant parents, especially yeah. Filipino immigrant parents' reactions yeah. to their children's choice of vocation, especially when it sort of like falls outside what's normally expected. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit more about that like um, process, if it was a process at all, and maybe it wasn't at all, in terms of um, your parents understanding the work that you do as a writer and how they how they sort of see it from their perspective? Yeah, um, I love this question. Uh, it's definitely been a process. Um, and I'll say this, like, I, I feel like I'm, I'm so lucky because I have been, I'm like, I've always been a loved child. Like, mm -hmm. unconditional love was a thing that, um, which is huge. It's the basis of everything good in my life. Um, I always had that from them. Uh, but I definitely have grown up and I've, you know, as I've been older, I've understood that, that my feeling was unconditional love is beautiful, but it doesn't mean that someone necessarily understands you. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think that my parents have always been supportive, but there's been a massive um, gulf between understanding what I do um, and uh, just like really getting it. <laughs> um, so, so I think, and I know that and I don't feel like they've been disappointed in me, but I think they've been sort of frustrated and ha haven't really understood like, and you know, like writing is not a lucrative career. You know? <laughs> so I think that they've been worried for me, mm -hmm. um, but um, it's a process. And I think now that I'm uh, established in my career, there have been certain markers of success that make it easier for them to, to get it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I didn't know this until a couple of years ago. My mom told me that when I started writing, doing food writing, just like freelance, like this was like 2006. Like, I think my dad's had like a Google alert for me for as long as he's oh. had. And I didn't know that he like reads everything that I write. So oh I mean, gosh. even if they can't say like, I don't know, even in times when I, I know that they are, they're trying, they're always trying to understand. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. I, sometimes I think I'm my dad is actually a really wonderful writer. I mean, he's, he's a pathologist, right? He's, he's the first person in his family to go to college. And his, my grandparents were like, you're going to be a doctor. And he was like, okay, whatever. Right? <laughs> do that. Um, which I think is also hard of why my parents were like, what are you doing? Like, can't right, you just do right. this thing that we said you were going to do? Right. And then I'm like, but you brought, you, you raised a daughter in America. Sorry. Like, I'm not probably not going to be exactly who you thought I was going to be. Right? Uh -huh. So there's a lot of working on, on both sides, but, um, I think in many ways that I am a writer, I'm, I'm toying with this theory. I think I'm a writer because I, I think everything I do is like a love letter to my parents. Oh. Like I think it is like a way of, I really so want, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's not like, sometimes it's unrequited, right? It's still <laughs> a little bit like, I, I feel like I write to like explain myself, right? And explain mm -hmm. the world that I see. And I've grown up constantly translating who I am to them, mm -hmm. constantly translating. You know, when you grow up and you see your parents disrespected, right? They don't have the vocabulary to say microaggression, but like mm -hmm. you witness that and that's horrifying. 
And so I felt like I grew up translating my parents mm -hmm. back to the world. Like, no, really, they're like normal. They're, they're this and they're that, right? They're so smart. They're so hardworking, right? And then I'm, trans I'm also like translating the world, like America, right, to them, mm -hmm. right? Which is not to say that they don't understand it. It's just right. that they see it through a particular lens. So I think like so much of writing is making sense of those things and so many disparate mm -hmm. elements. And um, yeah, I think that, that I just, the, who I am and how I grew up and like how I write, I think all of that is, it's very much tied up for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Together. Yeah. Yep. Part of why I asked that question is because I feel like, like I'm really amazed at how long my parents have hung in there with me, you know, and I still see them as like hanging in there. <laughs> yeah. very, like, much, oh. very much true for myself, yes. <laughs> like, how is this going to turn out? <laughs> um, but before we opened the restaurant, I was working in other restaurants. Um, for a while, like probably when we opened the restaurant, 2012, probably when we opened the restaurant, I'd been working in for about eight years in the restaurant industry. And that was after 10 years in nonprofits, which mm -hmm. they also were like, what is going on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is not an improvement. Um, I mean, I think about parents, like Filipino parents, right? And you're like, so I work for a nonprofit. And it's like, so you're not making money. <laughs> <laughs> like it's a very the first hit is like a literal translation right, right. <laughs> it's not a it's not a fun translation um so i think i was i've just been really like amazed at how i've made like so many very different choices and they really have just been so supportive and yeah. And not like everything has been like super smooth sailing, but I just feel like they've always, it's like what you said about the unconditional love thing. Yeah. I just feel like it's such a foundation that everything else is put on top of. And, yeah. um, and it really is amazing to me that, you know, with everything that they sacrificed and left behind in the Philippines, um, I just can't imagine that feeling of, sacrificing all those things and then making see, seeing someone that you wanted to give every option to just making choices that seem curious right. <laughs> yeah no I think about it as like my parents are have always been they've always loved me and then they've been as supportive as they have been able to be mm -hmm. right like mm -hmm. even if it doesn't make sense mm -hmm. and even if they say things that make me feel like mm -hmm. so you think I'm a failure right <laughs> um, but uh yeah I think to the to the extent that it has been possible to them, like everything that they've been able to do to support me, they have. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it's not, it's so imperfect, but that's family, right? Mm -hmm. Like you just, yeah. <clears throat> you, you, you talk it through or, or you don't talk it through, <laughs> um, but you're just, you just show up mm -hmm. however, and sometimes it's messy and that's just the way it goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like and I think it like, it. it goes the other way too, in terms of like what we want from them. It's mm -hmm. like maybe the <clears throat> more important to remember is how much they love us. And that like, sometimes I feel like I want a very particular kind of endorsement that's probably not going to come. Yeah. But then it's sort of like, it's okay. Like they support in the way that they can, like you were yeah. saying, and the love is there. And, you know, like it, it's not always coming in the form necessarily maybe that we want it to. Yeah. But that's not like the end of the world. Right. Right. I think it's really important to look at them with, with compassion for everything yeah. they did give and everything that they sacrificed and realize like, and I don't want to say this in a way that diminishes their abilities, but it's just like, I just feel like there's so many things that they weren't capable of giving me because they were just like focused on survival. Right. Mm -hmm. So figuring out how to, you know, I don't know, like, you know, get 100% behind like creative work as like, mm -hmm. you know, like there, there's just, I, I just think that they, I think they came here and they were alone, yeah. right? Like Filipinos are all about family and community and they came to the U.S. and were utterly alone, really, mm -hmm. um, for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I think that they, yeah, I just think that, again, like it's, we can't, I try to, it, it's, both things can be true that I can feel like I didn't get all the things that I wanted from them, but that like, uh, but that they gave me everything that they could. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. So part of why, I was, one of the many reasons why I was excited to talk to you today was I was excited to talk to another Panay mom friend. Uh-huh. Because I don't really like have a Panay mom friend that I'm like in touch with on the regular, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. adding another layer to that is being an industry mom. Um, I feel like there's so many more restaurant industry moms now than there used to be. And so I, I love even just thinking about them and thinking that they're also there working in a restaurant and having, you know, mm -hmm. dealing with childcare and distance learning and everything, but I don't actually get to like see them or talk to them uh -huh. because we're so busy. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. You know, <laughs> it's like, when would industry moms hang out exactly? Like even before COVID, because yeah. I know for me, it's like, if I wasn't working service, and I had a free night off, it's really hard not to have a lot of guilt about not spending that with your family. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, so I'm just like, and, and, and also I just feel like, you know, through the social means, I feel like I like so enjoy your, your approach to parenting and your family. And um, I just like feel such great, like very joyful vibes. Um, and so in terms of, I feel like food is such like a central family thing in our culture. Mm -hmm. And so I would love to hear about how you introduce Filipino food to your daughters and like what that, what are they into it? Like, do they like to eat? Like, yeah. In terms of connecting them to, to your experience and your, you know, like your heritage. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, a huge... I'm going to kind of back up a little bit and then take on this question. So a huge reason I can see it now in hindsight that I became a food writer because that wasn't like a predictable path um, was because of how I was raised. So my, my parents came and they cooked Filipino food for us a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've always loved Filipino food, right? Like my older brother, this is not a diss on him, but he was just, like, he was not feeling it, right? Like he wanted peanut butter and jelly and he wanted like old El Paso tacos, which I also wanted, but I loved sinigang. Um, I loved Ponce Palabok. Uh -huh. um, that was like my favorite, favorite food. It's the best and taco. It is. But so this is really interesting. And this is the thing that I think about all the time is how, wh where I grew up, this was before I mean, the only thing in like the ethnic aisle at the supermarket in the town that I grew up was like La Choy, like La Choy brand <laughs> soy sauce, right? And so my parents like were really committed to making Filipino food against kind of all odds. <laughs> like, there, there were not ingredients. So we would sometimes go to New York, we would visit my tita oh. in New York City and they would buy like multiple 50 pound bags of rice and we would get the like tiparos, uh, <laughs> patis, right? <laughs> like all of this like rufina, like we would get massive quantities of like Filipino ingredients and bring them home. But so my mom knew that I loved palabok. And so she would make punset palabok, but she was not pounding shrimp heads. She used to make punset palabok with Campbell's condensed cream of shrimp soup. That is brilliant. <laughs> right. So there was this, this adaptation that I think was like, but I, it's to them. I mean, that work that they did was like, it instilled in me, like, it was their connection to home. So I see that mm -hmm. now. And so, yeah. so much of like, when I got into food writing, I did it with a huge chip on my shoulder because I was like, why, do, why isn't anyone writing about our food? Like, mm -hmm. why is this ethnic food? We're all ethnic, mm -hmm. right? Like, mm -hmm. why aren't we talking about like Filipino food or any food of any other culture? Like, you know, here in Seattle, like people would be like, oh, right. Like you're talking about a $20 plate of pasta. Now it's so worth it. But then people like turn and, you know, in a very racist turn, complain about paying more than $8 for a bowl of pho, mm -hmm. right? And so I was always like, um, I, I wrote uh, because I wanted to see myself and the people I love and the things that I love represented, mm -hmm. right? So those are like, that's a huge driving force. So that like translates into, so like my love of Filipino food is very deep. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a part of our life, right? And so my daughters who are, my husband is white. So I've definitely spent a lot of time thinking about how do I pass down my culture? Like it is really important to me that they know that they mm -hmm. are Filipina. And mm -hmm. that starts, um, I mean, their names are like mm -hmm. completely like Noli is named after Noli Metangare. Mm -hmm. She is named after the first 
act of like Asian resistance against you know, <laughs> you know European colonialism, right? Um, and Ligaya, we wanted like an uncolonized name. Mm-hmm. Uh, or I, I mean, my husband goes along with this. And it's not that he doesn't want those things too, but like this mm-hmm. is very much like my personal like, <laughs> motivation. Um, but so as far as Filipino food goes, I actually, you know, I grew up eating it and I make some things, but I really relied on my parents. Mm-hmm. Um, and because we live close to my parents, like there's a lot of, and I think for a long time I thought, I can't cook it as well as they do. So mm-hmm. we'll just go over there. But, um, <laughs> but I've, but it's, it's, I've taken on more and more as they've, as, as they've been growing, like I do it more often and it's, it's so important to me. Um, so every year for birthdays and everyone's birthday, we make, uh, hunset noodles for long life. Right, right. Um, they exactly. Love, they love hunset. Like luckily they, they do like Philippines. My daughter, no, doesn't like shrimp, which is so odd to me but i'm gonna not see it as a character flaw but but they love they love arascaldo um yummy they love tinola they love soups Mm. um and they do love adobo and we make uh lumpia Mm -hmm. i made lumpia for noli's uh preschool class um as like a to come in and talk about stuff so they they're very open and they've both been to the philippines and they'll try everything but they're not um yeah i mean of course i want them to be eating like burro and like <laughs> I want them to be eating like all that stuff and they're not necessarily into that um but yeah like all kinds of stews nalaga they really love oh I love Nilo, nilaga. like yeah. that kind of thing um but they also eat a ton of American food and ton, they, they eat widely you know and actually mm-hmm. I didn't make puns this year because Noli requested that I make pad thai oh really <laughs> Yeah, she loves pad thai. She's had restaurant pad thai and been like, it's not as good as yours. So, oh. <laughs> of course, like, straight to my heart, I'll make you whatever you want. And I was like, it's still noodles. So. Totally. Um, but yeah, like, that's food is a big way, right? And we gather with my parents um, now that we can do that again. Um, mm-hmm. And Filipino food is always, there's always something Filipino on the table. Mm-hmm. And, and then we've also been expanding, um, you know, my... Uh, I wasn't raised speaking Tagalog, which is something that I feel a certain amount of embarrassment and maybe even a little bit of shame. And that's been a conversation that I've had with my parents. When I was growing up, I asked them, like, why didn't you teach us Tagalog? And they told me that it's because I didn't want to learn. And <laughs> when I got to be like a surly teenager, I was like, how did I, how did I learn English? Like, I learned English because that's what you spoke to me. And it was only until like, you know, my, maybe my late teens and early 20s that my father, like, we had this really, he had a, you know, he was able to make himself really vulnerable and was like, I mean, Filipinos are so adaptable. Mm-hmm. He was like, I really felt like I was discriminated against and people made fun of me because I had yeah. a accent and I didn't want that for you. Mm-hmm. And I think he kind of regrets it and I'm sad about it. And I have tried to learn to go, like, it's kind of like, it's like over the course of a lifetime that it's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I lived in the Philippines for six months after I graduated from college and all of my cousins were like, because everyone speaks perfect English. They were like, your accent is so bad. <laughs> they were like, it's just really easier if we speak English. And I was like, oh man. And that's hard. It is. Um, and then I took like an immersive class. I, I mean, I, my husband and I, after we got married, um, lived in the Philippines for a month. And we each had like, you know, we had a tutor come and work with us for like five hours a day for a that's couple of That's so cool. Months. And, but it was frustrating though, because my teacher was like, you know Tagalog, you totally know Tagalog. And I was like, I, I don't, like I have the vocabulary, <laughs> I have the capability, I can understand it pretty well, but I have the capabilities of like a five-year-old. And, but she, and I was like, what I would need to do is like probably go and live with people. And I think I could pick it up pretty quickly, but no one, the option of speaking English, like shouldn't exist right. at all. Right. Um, Cause especially with family, you're going to default to the, the best way to communicate, right? right. Which is. I don't know. So anyway, but so my, my daughter spent a lot of time with my parents and I've asked them to speak in Tagalog with them because I want them oh. to have if nothing else, the amount of Tagalog that I have. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my dad just got us as a present. He got us a like Rosetta subscription so that we can work oh, on our, so our Tagalog together. Yeah. I bet you they must love speaking to them in Tagalog. They do. They love it. And oh. <laughs> yeah, it's very sweet, you know, and the, um, the little one has, has, you know, picks it up, has picked it up, I think, because we started more um, when she was younger. Uh-huh. She yeah. is mini me. <laughs> she totally is. She is yeah, that's <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> she is, she does, it's funny, it's weird, like, um, 
it's strange like to have someone and when people say that like that she looks just like you and I'm I'm willing to concede that she does look a lot like me and she has her own distinct personality but mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. um, I think it's really it's powerful when you become a mother and then you have like my oldest daughter like I feel so connected to her and I love her but mm -hmm. she's like a little she, she's lighter skinned and I sometimes worry that she can pass for white um but the little it's I don't know it's a I've never actually talked about this it's a really strange experience to have someone who looks so much like me um I think it makes me confront all of the like internalized stuff about like how I feel about how I look and mm -hmm. um, you know but it's wonderful to hear people be like she looks like you and she's so cute oh, she's, she's so beautiful like just like you. <laughs> oh thank you um Javier I do have these moments with my son Javier it I think it happened more when he was like three or four he like really super looked exactly like me when he was like three and four years old he still looks so much like me mm -hmm. like I spit him out yes. yeah <laughs> and we actually had a friend once who was visiting we were like hanging out together when he was about two or something and she turned to Ben my husband and she goes I think that Genevieve made this baby all by herself <laughs> Like carbon <laughs> copy he looked like you took one of those like old knuckle buster credit card things yeah. <laughs> i was one and he was the other you feel it apart and there you are yeah oh. but i have had these moments with him where i look at him and i literally feel like i'm just looking right at myself yeah now that he's older and his face is changing and he looks a lot more like ben every day I have other moments where he behaves like me and it's like that moment of recognition of behavior mm -hmm. that is like so exactly like that thing that you do that you know about yeah, yeah. sometimes you don't like it yeah no it's and they're that's like, what I meant like it's a little scary sometimes oh yeah yeah and sometimes it's like sometimes it can be painful you know like when it's something that's that's something that I still struggle with now as an adult. Like yeah. he, he um, can be so hard on himself. And when he has those moments, I feel like for me, like my first, my first reaction is to respond to him as his mother. Mm -hmm. you know? Where I'm like, oh, you know, like it's okay. You don't have to get it right the first time. Or like, you know, keep practicing. Like you, you'll get the song eventually. Like the more you practice, the more you improve. Um, and then I have this other reaction underneath that where I'm like, oh my God, is that what I do? Mm. It's horrible, you know? Yeah. It like, makes me like so sad because yeah. I want to respond to him in the moment and be like, and make it okay. And like, make sure that he has a strong foundation where he doesn't do that to himself. But then I'm like, oh my gosh, I've been doing that this whole time. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it's like it takes a moment. It's really you have to be really self aware and generous yeah. with yourself and be like, okay, so I, I'm doing that to him. Like, can I, can I do that for myself? Too? Right. Um, I mean, Lagaya is only two, so it's it's different because she's really young. But um, she, she's she seems very precocious. She seems older. She's than very you. precocious. She's <laughs> very strong willed. She's very communicative. Like that. I mean, there are some similarities and it's it's scary um, <laughs> but she is she's also um she's very defiant it's part of being two but she is yeah. she's a, such a strong personality and she's so stubborn but um so she gets in, we have to discipline her right and so i have to talk to her about things and this is actually one of the one of the hardest things it's really like just like we were talking about so when i discipline her or she understands that i'm disappointed in her oh. one of her reactions is she'll go and she'll start scratching her own arm. Uh, and yeah, I always have to stop her and be like, we never hurt ourselves, right? But like the impulse to self-harm is one that has, has been with me throughout my life. Um, and so it's terrifying. And so I, I see it and I'm like, I need to stop this in her. I need to show her that she needs to be good to herself. Like that's where it feels like real work, but it's also mm -hmm. like I'm telling myself the same yeah. thing. You know, and now as I'm older, it's not, it's not, it's not the same because it's not as physical, but like that impulse exists in me, always has. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, I've turned it, I mean, it's, it's almost worse. I feel like it's almost like an inward psychological kind of thing. Um, but yeah, like there's so much of, uh, 
so much of parenting is, and I, I don't mean this as like, and we talked about it a little bit at the beginning, like I realized that my parents gave me so much, but the way I parent my daughters is, is very much like wanting to work with giving them all the things my parents gave me, but also explicitly giving them everything that they didn't. Mm -hmm. everything they like weren't really capable of um like I think in immigrant families or at least in mine there was just so much silence mm -hmm. right I mean there's a lot of talking right? but there's a lot of talking and, like, <laughs> and that kind of thing but there's not like I mean like we didn't talk about our bodies right we didn't talk about race we didn't talk about identity like my parents gave me object lessons but like i'm just my husband teases me because sometimes he's like you know not everything is a <laughs> learning opportunity with the girl <laughs> because i'm just like i'm talking about everything because i want them to feel like they can talk to me about anything mm -hmm. i don't want i don't want the silence mm -hmm. that exists to be filled with like cultural bullshit from other mm -hmm. places right mm -hmm. I still feel like while I can like control the dialogue to a certain extent like mm -hmm. I want them to know where I, what I feel about like mm -hmm. everything right mm -hmm. so like I don't know if a two-year-old can really how much a two-year-old really graphs black lives matter but like we're talking about it right like there's there's all of these things you know and my my six-year-old will be like brown lives matter I'm like nope uh we know they matter right but we'll know that everyone knows that black that all lives matter when black lives matter it's just it's just stuff like that that I mean I don't know if I'm doing it right but um well I think it's so important yeah. because I mean what do we know we know that what they hear the messages they hear at this age are the ones that stick with them forever yeah and if they're not hearing it from us they're hearing it from someplace else yeah I, I can't take that risk <laughs> yeah totally yeah. totally mm -hmm. um so something I really love about your writing and I f I'm feeling more and more that this is a quality that's shared among writers that I really love, especially who are writing now um, about the world and culture using different frameworks, is um, that they, they have a very clear voice as like um, an analyzer or a critic, and they can be incredibly um, incisive in terms of making connections between things that maybe people don't normally connect. And as analytical as they are, they also really like share themselves in their writing. Like they, they are fully human, <laughs> you know, like they inhabit the world and they share who they are, but it doesn't like take over whatever they're writing about. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel that way when I read you. And um, so I read this is, piece. Thank you. That is so nice. <laughs> it's like, it means so much to me, really. Thank you. I read, um, there was this piece in the New York Times that just came out the other day by Wesley Morris. Do you read him? The mustache? Oh my God. Yes. Oh my God. I was like, I, um, I like saved it for a moment. Uh, <laughs> When I could like sit and, and then the moment came at four o'clock in the morning when I woke up and was like, I, I don't want to get out of bed, but I like need to. And I was like, I'm going to, um, what a beautiful. I mean, beautiful besides the picture, day. which is just pure gold. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. It was just, it was like you started on, you started, you left for a trip and you didn't know where you were going mm -hmm. or no, you thought you were going somewhere and it ended up not at all being the place where you ended up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's how I felt. But anyway, I mentioned that because I feel like that when I read his rating too. Mm -hmm. And um, I just love, and I think it just is like, I feel like it's a new moment in terms of writers that are doing nonfiction writing where mm -hmm. they can, they can be present and still, you know, be writing about whatever they're writing about, but they don't have to be like, have this arm's length thing. Yeah. Yeah. Have credibility. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah I, uh, I have so many thoughts on this. <laughs> um, I just love, I love the way that you des describe this kind of writing and I feel, I feel very seen because I feel like that's the writing that I want to do. I feel like totally giddy that I would be remotely associated with like, like <laughs> Leslie Morris's style of writing, but that's like, I'm just enjoying that in a moment too. But um, yeah, I think that I, 
I feel like I, I grow into that style of writing more. Um, you know, I think I've been thinking a lot about like my, just even being a writer, I want, is that a reflection of like internalized whiteness to like be able to express yourself so clearly, like to place these, um, you know, sometimes I wish I was more like an experimental writer, but I'm like, nope, really love form and grammar. Like really, <laughs> you know, like these things are just, they're, I think at this point, they're probably just part of who I am. Um, but I've never, so I'm not like a trained journalist. Like I've done, I can do journalism, but I, like writing is personal, um, but I think, I don't, I mean, I, I can't speak for Wesley Morris, but I feel like <laughs> many writers of color, um, I, there was a lot that I identified in that piece of like, kind of threading a needle of being like, mm -hmm. respectable, acceptable, which is mm -hmm. code for like being white, mm -hmm. right? Um, but also really wanting to be who you are and, mm -hmm. and think that's like a negotiation. And mm -hmm. one of the beauty, one of the beautiful things about aging right, is being comfortable in who you are. And I feel like I write deeper into that comfort mm -hmm. and resisting this, you know, when I wrote my book, um, like a mother, I definitely, I didn't think I was like, la, 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 I'm writing a book about science and pregnancy. I'm not writing a book about myself. And I I had to make it more personal because everything that I was writing about, like I I literally needed to put like skin in the game because it mm -hmm. wasn't it wasn't as effective and this stuff is so personal. But so I personal. hesitated to do that because I had kind of internalized this idea that it's not that I don't think my story is valuable. It's just that the market <laughs> reveals that like the outside world doesn't necessarily think that stories like mine are as valuable. And especially having been a food writer you know, people want to hear about your trip to France or like your mm -hmm. like relationship to like French food and baguettes, but like no one, like, <laughs> sorry, like it's, it's really no, I'm like. Also, I'm partially laughing because my husband is obsessed with baguettes right now and he never <laughs> has been ever, ever, ever. And it's because he read this book that was set in France and then he just started buying baguettes like for the past three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love a baguette. Let's just be clear, right? But I definitely felt like there was not, there's more room now for personal, um, more personal writing about your cultural heritage, right? Of mm -hmm. a diverse array of people. Like when I was doing it, like this was like 13 years ago, there was less room. There was room, but there was less room. Okay, that's all I'm saying. Um, but so I had this idea that uh, it was risky to like write about myself because who cares, right? And And to be to be widely read, um, you had, I had to give something besides my story. Like I had to be useful in some way. And I think, you know, like, and writing a book about pregnancy, it's not like a traditional guidebook, but it definitely like, I also wanted to create something that was like, a, that would be useful to people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that's part of that. But I, I definitely feel like in this new book that I'm working on, I, there's much more of myself in it. Um, and it feels really good to write that way. It also feels, it's very vulnerable. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's difficult to do that because it's writing about like who I am fundamentally. So that's challenging. Mm -hmm. But um, I like the way you put it. I, I am, I feel so fucking human these days. <laughs> like, I have this body that is like so inconvenient sometimes. Or I have these tears that just come all the time. Oh. Um, I feel really human and really like pulsing and yeah. <laughs> sort of like lumping and well, that's what we and, are yeah and in a way that I think like I think that that's really beautiful and I want to mm -hmm. reflect all of that so mm -hmm. and also like I'm I'm a body but I'm very much also a brain and I'm pulling mm -hmm. from all these things I'm always like analyzing and thinking through things and I want to try to find a place um where those two can can coexist really happily and equally mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so as a writer <clears throat> how how has your experience being Filipino American in this country informed your perspective and like your voice in terms of how you decide to approach things that you're writing about? Yeah. Um, Even if it's like indirect. Yeah, no, I'm, well, I think I, I mentioned this like a little bit earlier, but I, everything I do, I'm always, th as a writer, I'm always thinking about like, who's telling this story? Mm -hmm. Who gets left out of this story, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, because I, again, like I write to, to put myself into the places that I wanna see myself because I didn't see that growing up, mm -hmm. right? Like I, um, so that's a, that's a huge part of it. It's, a, a, it's, um, it's representation. And so that, and that extends beyond like me, 
right? Like, so when I was working as a food writer at The Stranger, which is all weekly in Seattle, like I was blessed to have an editor who was a woman of color. Um, and I don't think I ever told her this, but she knew, like my goal was to have like a, every twice a month, it was a weekly paper, the photo that went with the food story would be a picture of a person of color, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And we would write about, um, you know, we wouldn't just write about dinner. We would write about breakfast and lunch and we would write about, um, you know, we, would, we wouldn't just do like cheap eats, right? Mm -hmm. Or like, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right? So, that's, so it's always like, to me, that's, that's, a, that's probably like the, the driving thing um, that being, and it's not specific to being Filipino, but it's just being someone who's, you know, in a minority or marginalized community, like just mm -hmm. to represent, like that's mm -hmm. like the thing I, I feel very strongly about that. Um, and then I just think, you know, like being Filipina, I'm so proud of being Panay and I love who I am and I love our culture and I love people. And, but we're also like super nuanced, right? And Filipino Americans, you know, we don't talk enough about how the Philippines was a colony of the United mm -hmm. States. We have a very distinct relationship to American culture and it's just, it's exhausting, but it's like, we have this really rich perspective. And so I think being, being Filipina is so, like, I don't know how to separate it mm -hmm. from who I am. It informs everything. And I like to think that I, I try to bring that same kind of richness to my writing, which is like, I just, it's not enough to just tell a personal story. I want to provide some historical context. I would like mm -hmm. to provide like a reference to like some artwork that I think feels relevant. And so I think there's a lot of grading that I try to do um, that reflects, you know, many sources of inspiration in the same way that being Filipina and being Filipina American has so many different aspects to it. Mm -hmm. If that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I think if anything, something that I've been feeling more and more about the Filipino American community in the US is that um, the stories are getting um, more nuanced, as you said, mm -hmm. like that in terms of representation, there's so many representations now, like yes. across the board and also like Filipino Americans as public figures doing all different kinds of things, you know? Yes. And um, I mean, for me, that was what was so like, that was what made me cry that night when I was, it was literally like I had come home late after service and I had listened to the Fresh Air episode like a couple days before and I was just like wanting to find out more about you and I fell down this like internet rabbit hole and then I found a picture of you and I was like, hold oh. up. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. I think she's Panay. And then I was- you can like, tell by looking. I mean, we've all have a very trained- <laughs> well, I was like the name and then the picture, but then I wanted like confirmation. So then I found it somehow, somewhere. I can't remember where. And I literally started weeping like so hard. And, and I think it was because like, like I've been listening to Fresh Air since I was 15. And I think that you were the first Filipino American that I've ever heard interviewed on that show. Oh. You know? Yeah. And it just was like, and not only that, but it was like, when I was listening to your interview, I just was like so loving everything that you were saying, even though Javi is like eight years old now, there's so much about my, pregnancy and birth that is like very, very vivid to me and mm -hmm. still continues to inform how I feel as like a physical person. Like, sure. Yeah. Me. It's, you know, so it's, like, it's very present, even though it's not like I have a newborn or I don't yeah. even have like a two year old, but it still is always like present with me. So yes. when I was listening to the discussion you were having, I was just like really feeling it. And then, and then when I realized that you were Panay, it was just like, I don't know, I was just so overcome. And um, and so I think that's something that gives me like so much joy about where our community is right now is I feel like um, that there are these cohorts of people and I feel like people around our generation and then younger, a few half generations below us also, I feel like people are really like embracing freedom to like fully inhabit themselves yes you know and like um and challenge 
other people's expectations of who they think they should be. Mm -hmm. And even including when sometimes they're challenging expectations of others in our community. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so um, I just am so like heartened by that. And, and I just feel like it, it feels really special, you know? Yeah. I mean, I was thinking, you know, again, it's not like, I, mean, I think white people have a misconception too, that like, you know, like your people of color and, and, you know, specifically of all, you know, talking about me here, like, you know, Pani, we're, I'm not walking around being like, Pani. <laughs> right? like, I'm just me, right? Like, like I have a, who I am is a rich and multifaceted person, right? And so there's, I, but when you were talking about listening to me on Fresh Air, I'm really proud. I mean, first of all, if I am the first Philippine, I don't know if I am, but like, that makes me so proud. But it also, like, I do feel a certain amount of pride that I'm not on there specifically, that I wasn't on there specifically to talk about being mm -hmm. Filipino American. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I could mm -hmm. definitely do that. If Terry mm -hmm. Gross wants to like have a talk, like, <laughs> we could have a talk, right? Like I'd be, it would like, I would be lovely to talk about that part of my identity because I'm, I'm so happy to do that. And I'm so proud, but like, that's the thing. Like, I don't have to do that. Right. Right. Like, and that you could feel, I mean, I just feel like you could feel that there is something, you know, maybe more like expansive or generous or critical in my perspective that you could relate to and that that is definitely a shared part of our shared heritage right but it's not the thing that you have to lead with right right, right. and i think that that's something that um i will admit like i have struggled through a lot of my life because like, always assimilation has been like the goal filipinos are really good at adapting and assimilating i have struggled um with feeling like I, and also because I didn't grow up around a lot of Filipinos and I don't have a lot, I don't have like a, a strong cohort. I don't have like a barcada of people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There were times in my life, I mean, I, the other day I said to someone like, what would my life have been like if I had grown up in Daly City, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, that was like a thing, like I, I feel jealous, right? I'm like, oh. if I had grown up in like Milpitas or like West Covina, like what would I be like, right? And it wouldn't be you. Right, exactly. And But that's a thing that I'm still coming into and right like it's it's I like just being able to express this and say this which is that I have struggled with feeling like I'm not Filipina enough mm -hmm. right like I don't speak Tagalog um like my body type is very different than like what everyone in my family would lead me to believe is what a Filipino <laughs> body is right um so there's there's all of these things but um but I'm, I'm getting more comfortable with, and what you were saying really resonates with me, which is like, I am Filipino enough because I am, I am right. who I am. And like, that is enough. Yeah. And there is no one way mm -hmm. to be Filipino. Mm -hmm. And I just think you're right. Like we just see more and more of that. And I want to be part of, you know, with whatever kind of like little platform that I have is just to, um, you know, I think people like you reaching out to me, like when you reach out to me, that meant so much to me. You were one of the first people. I think you were the first person. Really? Like, yeah, you are also Penai, and like that means something to me. And I realized like it's it meant something to you to like see yourself in me. So but much. It meant so much to me to be seen by you. Uh -huh. And it was, it's being seen. Like those are the things that mean the most to me. That's like the feedback that I never anticipated getting was like hearing from so many women and realizing like, oh, like I have a chance to like rep us in mm -hmm. a way. Um, so I'm never gonna shy away from like sharing that part of my life. Again, mm -hmm. it's, I don't ever have to do it all the time because I, I, there's so many other things to me, but it's like, a, I don't know, it's like the way water is like part of your body. It's like 98%, right. but like right. you can't really pinpoint the exact place. Like that's right, how right. I feel about being Filipina. Right. <laughs> no, that's perfect. <laughs> Anyway. So I think maybe to wrap up, I've just got this one last question. Okay. And it's one that I've asked. You're my third interview. I've asked everyone this question at, at the at the end. Um, how how do you see your legacy in terms of what do you want your community, your communities, mm -hmm. um, to take away from the work that you do? Huh. Um, well, I think my number one community is my, I mean, I, I don't want to rank them in terms of importance, but my, 
it's my family, uh-huh. right? When I think about what defines my life, like it's a dream come true to be a writer, but if that went away, like who would I be, right? Mm-hmm. Who is me as a person? And that has to do with my family being a good spouse and partner and being a mother. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think to raise, to love someone, to love my husband, Will, and to love my children in a way that allows them to be fully themselves, um, that maybe no one else ever sees that but them. Like that's, mm-hmm. that's the number one thing that I want um, to be my legacy, um, for them to know me and for them to know that I know them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if I broaden that out a little bit, I think, you know, I, I feel like this is all stuff that we've touched on, you know, mm-hmm. like as a writer, as any kind of semi-public facing person, um, you know, in the, I'll talk specifically about like Filipino American, because that's, you know, what, what is bringing us together. Like, it really is that there's, I'm just going to be myself. Mm-hmm. And I want people to, if people who see me to be like, that's her, mm-hmm. right? And that's enough. She is who she is. And to show people that um, just being who you are is enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's interesting that that has sort of been a common thread so far in every interview. Maybe phrased like slightly differently, mm-hmm. but just like a sense of like what it, what it means for each person to be themselves and like yeah. how long sometimes it takes to figure that out yeah. or like how much resistance there is to inhabiting that person mm-hmm. sometimes. Yeah. And sometimes from your own self. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much for making the time to chat with us today. I feel like this has been like incredibly cathartic. (laughs) And also just that it feels so good to see you and make connection after these two years of like sending each other messages. Um, I just feel, I feel really so appreciative and grateful that you are out there in the world and that you're writing and using your voice um, in the way that you do, just because um, it just it just matters. It matters, and it um, it touches people in ways that you will never know. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. And it's just like a really, really special thing. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm just uh, just crying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm always, it's like a miracle to me whenever I hear from anyone, like that someone would take the time to like reach out to me. So it really like to know that it, I know that it matters, but like to actually have that is, um, it's just so meaningful. And um, thank you. I mean, I said this before, I think we started recording though, that like I did this interview, um, not so much to talk about me, but to like be in service of Genevieve Villamora and Bad Saint. <laughs> and I feel like your work, the work that you do is important and what you put out there is so significant and meaningful to people. So um, I'm just happy to be a part of it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Bye. Bye.